Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Book Club. Um, today we are going to be reading uh, Brandon Taylor's Real Life. Um, I'm very excited to read this book. It is a finalist for the Booker and it was also named Book of the Year by New York Times, The Washington Post, New York Public, Li Public Library, Vanity Fair, um, just to name a few. Before further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our guest, um, Kevin Lunianga, is a senior analyst at Global Affairs Canada. Prior to joining the public service, Kevin worked as a flight attendant for two years at WestJet. He's a graduate of the MA program at the Centre of Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto, where he taught and led discussions on policing in Canada and the sociology of law. In his spare time, Kevin sits on the board of directors for an Ottawa-based NGO named Max Ottawa, which provides health and wellness support for queer and trans individuals in the national capital region. And with that, I turn it to Kevin for his presentation. Thank you Please so welcome. much. Thank you so much, Yusha, for the introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm very excited to be here to speak on the book, Real Life by Brandon Taylor. I wrote quite a few notes. Um, I thought the book was fantastic. It was well done. It was well written. The themes that I think came out were especially pertinent in our day and time today, uh, especially post, actually during the Black Lives Matter movement that we're, I think, still living through. Um, and it being pride, pride session for, for you folks, mm -hmm. I think it was a very, very fantastic choice. So I'll speak a bit about myself first so you, get, you folks get an idea of who I am and sort of my story and my experience. Um, as mentioned, I, I work for the public service in Ottawa at Global Affairs Canada. Most of my day is reading documents, uh, reviewing. Uh, I usually work with policies that relate to um, the prime minister and his cabinet. So that's my day job. But Ottawa is a bit of a boring city, as most <laughs> of you probably know. And so I try to find activities and do things that keep things entertaining and fun. And <laughs> Uh, as mentioned by Niosha, I, I sit on a board of directors for queer uh, and trans youth in, in Ottawa. And so reading this book really, really sat well with me. So um, I'm sure if, if folks had the chance to read the book, you noticed that the ending was uh, left us with many questions, right? Uh, we know that in the book, Wallace, the main character, um, decided you know, he wasn't actually sure if he was going to stay and finish the program uh, over at the university, or that he was going to go, you know, back home and sort of live his life. It's unclear, right? And I really, really identified with him because, you know, his Alabama, his home, is like Ottawa for me, <laughs> right? So I was born and raised in Ottawa. I ran away when I was 18. I wanted nothing to do with it. Came to Toronto, studied, worked as a flight attendant. And then I found my way back to Ottawa, and it's actually treated me quite well. But I, I, I think the way that Taylor leaves us in intrigue and in suspense is, is, is a piece that I really, really appreciated, right? So I think what really, really sat well with me is that topics that are difficult to talk about were focused on in this book. Topics that I would say are a bit taboo, or gray areas, I like to call them, in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion were addressed in this book. And I want to start us off with five points that really sat with me that I think I encourage everyone else to really push yourselves and to think about these questions because it pushes us to really critique the system that we're in and our implications within it. So I think the first point or experience in the book that really resonated well with me and I thought was had me asking questions and still asking questions is um, on page 95 when we have the experience uh, with Dana, one of uh, Wallace's uh, science mates, who uh, tells him that he's a misogynist, right? And Wallace is a black gay man. And so she, she, she brings up the fact that he's acting in a misogynistic way, and she then pushes it further and says that um, women are the new N-words and F-bombs uh, in this society, right? So she makes a salient point around misogyny, but then pushes it too far with a queer phobic and an anti-black comment. But I did, for it forces me to think, and I think forces all of us to sit with ourselves, because of when we think about intersections and identities and 
how complex and intricate they are, I think it's an important point around misogyny. And even as a black gay man, the implications in that behavior and the, the necessity to kind of question, push, and unlearn. So I think the way that Taylor makes us really think about identity, the way he pushes these gray boundaries is, is really something I appreciated. So that's one of the, the points that I, I really encourage folks to think about. When you think about identity intersections, who we are, uh, questions of, of oppression and how they really, how they intersect and are, are often in gray spaces. Uh, the second piece that I think was of relevance is this discussion on open relationships. Right? And so uh, on page 125, Cole and Vincent, uh, a gay couple, are seen in conflict because they're not sure about opening up their relationship. They're not sure about what that means. Right? And I think the way that Taylor shows that conflict, the way that he showcases the fact that you know, a closed relationship for queer people allows us to assimilate. It takes away extra attention on us because we resemble the norm, we resemble the heteronormative folk, so by following this norm, we get attention or eyes that are placed away from us, right? And he really pushes us to think about what that means, right? Who has the privilege to, to actually, you know, be the norm, to, to, to follow that, that, that way of living, right? And who actually can push it? Right? And you think about identities and you're like, well, as a black person, um, can you assimilate? Right? What does that look like? As a white person, can you assimilate and be in an open relationship? How, how do we do these things? Right? And I think the open relationship discussion talks about layers of internalized queer phobia also. Right? And how um, there's shame attached to, to being queer. And so what you try to do is you try to be as normal as you can try to appease and follow what we see as, as the norm. I, I think we, Taylor also pushes us to think about loss, right? Mourning, he, he lost his father and the relationship was tumultuous, right? And we actually learn later on that there's sexual assault in the, in the household as a, as, a, as a child growing up. Uh, and when he tells his classmates that he's lost his father, many of them are shocked to see that his reaction isn't He's not devastated by the loss, right? And then we see him try to act in certain ways or produce responses that he thinks are socially acceptable, right? So to tell someone that you're not sad that you've lost a parent is actually not acceptable. He's already black and queer, so tension's on him. So how does he, how can he maneuver? How can he actually lessen the eyes on him? And I think Taylor makes us think a bit about the added thinking and the necessary ways that you have to integrate and think and be strategic in order to fit in already as a queer black person. I really appreciated that experience and how, how difficult it is, really. Uh, we, we get a scene on page 161 with a Roman, uh, a French individual who's also in the school, uh, who tells Wallace, the, the protagonist, or the, the main character in the story, that he should be thankful that he's in graduate school. He should be thankful that he's received all the investments from the university and that quitting actually would be ungrateful of him, right? And I think in that piece, uh, it brings us to think about affirmative action, about the systems that are in place oftentimes. And I think the University of Toronto uh, is also having these discussions about how to diversify, how to bring in minority talent. But what you end up seeing is there's not that piece of support around how do we retain minority talent how do we provide the supports so that other folks in the university, other students are also accepting, are providing, you know, are being helpful and are seeing minority folks as equals, right? And that piece, I think Taylor makes us have to, to think a bit about I, how, how affirmative action and these different policies are, are situated in our, in our current time and how oftentimes they fall short, right? And I think the last piece that really sat with me is is allyship and what it means to be a, a white person who wants to support black issues, right? So we see different gradients of white folk in this book. We see people who are overtly racist and I think what we mostly see are people who don't know how to deal with anti-black racism when it, when it shows up. They, they're not sure. So what they do is they are silent. They're quiet. 
And it really made me think about how I think us as Canadians oftentimes deal with race, right? The comfort of silence, the comfort of I'm sorry, right? Using apologies as a way of diffusing the awkward situation, the, ant the racist situation, right? And I think Taylor bringing this up really forces us to think about what is our implication when a situation occurs in our environments that's racist? How do we, how do we step in, right? And the examples that he gave, I think, were very, very overt. It was a black person experiencing discrimination in a public setting. But I think what we see also is spaces that are entirely white. You know, it might be dinner with the family, dinner with the friends, and comments being thrown out, right? And I think the Canadian response is silence and to say, I'm sorry. So I thought it was very relevant that this an American book also brought this, this subject on, right? So those are a couple of pieces that I really, I would encourage everyone to really sit with and think about. Um, I, I continued reading the book and saw a lot of links to my personal life as a black queer man, uh, things that I wanna share with you folks. I think that um, add a bit to the reflection that you might've had with this reading, right? The first one is the manifestation with trauma and how trauma presents itself in this book. And we see Wallace, the main character, talk briefly about his experience with sexual assault. Um, and I think it was, was bold of the author to do, to, to do this because <coughs> black men as subjects of sexual assault is actually generally not really discussed or talked about. I think in, in mainstream media and how blackness and masculinity is portrayed, generally speaking, we're seen as perpetrators, right? And by focusing and having Wallace, someone who's experienced sexual assault frequently, uh, and, and actually deconstructing how that trauma impacts his modern day relationships, we see him struggle when he starts frequenting Miller, his classmate. We see him have a hard time to connect, to be open, to, to be vulnerable. He really has a hard time uh, with, with that experience, and we see how it's linked to some of the sexual assault that he, he experienced as a child, right? So already by by bringing up this discussion, I think Taylor did a really good job at breaking um, or have discussing something that's often undiscussed. And I think about my own experience as a black queer man. I'm 29 years old, and my first partner was uh, last year when I was 28. And I think about why it took me so long to feel comfortable dating, right? And slowly, as I peel back and look at my own traumas as a kid, um, I see a lot of internalized racism and internalized queer phobia, right? Growing up in Ottawa, I um, used to wear blue contacts as a child and I would denounce my African roots. I was ashamed of myself, right? Very ashamed of myself. And deep down, I was also ashamed of my queerness. And so it took me a long time of sitting with myself, asking those questions, um, really being solitary to then feel comfortable to start dating. And that was just a year ago. So when the author presents Wallace as a character who has never kissed someone before, I thought it was very humanizing. And I think a lot of black queer folk can identify with having that difficult situation with intimacy, right? And how it's linked oftentimes to our families, to you know, our experiences as, as youth, as kids. So really, I thought it was beautifully done. I think they also do a good job at giving sort of stories and information for folks maybe who don't have as much exposure with the queer community. So for example, we talk about you know, sexual assault, but also themes that are very specific to queer people were brought forward in this book. Right? And I wanna talk about desirability as one of them. So there was a scene where, uh, where Cole, uh, another gay man, and Wallace play tennis. And Cole is lamenting and sort of thinking about this open relationship of his, potential open relationship, and doesn't know what to do and, um, and Wallace says, well, he doesn't recognize that he has privilege as like an attractive white man and that you know, he's desirable in, in a context, any context actually. You think about who's sought after and who's desired, oftentimes we, we see that if you're white, you're tall, you're attractive, that's what it is, right? And I think being able to kind of talk about these kind of intra, mostly in between queer issues bringing it to the forefront and giving it a wider audience, I thought was very, very, very poignant and important. Now, um, the, 
there are a couple of other pieces that I, I want to sit with and I want to encourage folks to, to think about also. Um, one being interactions with other black folks in the book. Right? And I thought, for the most part, mm, other black people weren't portrayed in the best light. And I think, despite this, we see that you know, Wallace's interactions with other black folk were mostly tumultuous. His parents wasn't great. Um, you know, his stepfather, who sexually assaulted him, wasn't great. But then we see a scene where he's at a bar with his friend Bridget, who is who's Asian, and he spots a black woman. He spots her and says, huh, I just, I feel like I understand her. I feel like I'm connected to her, right? And I, 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 I say this because that's an experience that I think a lot of black folk, not queer, just black in general, have in spaces where we're, mini we're minorities. We see another black person and there's a sense of solace, right? A sense of understanding because anti-black racism, although I would say mostly a traumatic experience, also forces us to be resilient. We have no choice. I have no choice but to exist and to survive. And as such, when I see another black person, I think we have that understanding, that mutual head nod that, yes, we live in a society that is difficult for us, where black folk oftentimes lose their lives, uh, we're discriminated against, but also through that comes a sense of solidarity. And I thought it was beautifully done how, how, how Taylor pushes that to the forefront also in, in a very uh, a quick scene. And I think lastly, the book makes us reflect on our own journeys, on, on our lives and real life, right? I'm a public servant. What does that mean for me, right? So if I want to innovate and change the world, am I in the best place? Because generally speaking, there are difficulties with actually doing that kind of work. But also, if I leave, what, is a, what does it look like for me, right? And that question we saw with Wallace. He's in grad school and he's saying, do I stay? Do I tough it out? Do I assimilate or do I just go and, and experience my own life and see what's there? And we actually don't know what he ends up doing, which I think is, is, is so much, it, it leaves us with so much to the imagination. But I do think all of us pose, we pose ourselves those questions of, <coughs> do we stay in our comfort or do we go, right? And uh, we think about our lives and the relationships we have with people. Are they genuine, right? Are we having to, to anticipate the reactions that people want, like Wallace is doing oftentimes in his circles in order to, to survive? Or do we have these relationships where we could be frank and honest and talk about difficult topics openly, right? There are a couple of other pieces that I also think were very relevant. One is Wallace's sobriety. Him not consuming alcohol, I think, is, is an important piece because with trauma, and I think with a lot of black queer folk, um, I think alcohol is often a, a way to deal with trauma, right? Drinking, consuming is a way to forget, right? So th this question of our lives and that choice, that decision, the real life drinking is actually an outlet for many folks, right? And so seeing that Taylor chose a character that's sober and breaking down that story of sobriety and understanding where it comes from, the trauma of having a mother who consumed too much, um, what that means now for him, having to assimilate in social settings where, not top of being black and queer, more eyes are sent his way because he doesn't drink, right? So thinking a bit about how even these subtle ways, subtle choices that we make, and honestly choices that come from trauma oftentimes, complicate how we navigate the world every single day. Um, I myself, I took a year and a half of not drinking at all, sobriety. It was during my flight attendant days. I thought that um, it was difficult to control sort of my relationship to myself, to my blackness, to my queerness. I, I felt very uneasy all the time. And I felt like drinking gave me an outlet, right? So seeing how Taylor, I think, posits a sober character who's black and queer, and also able to do that reflection and push himself, I thought was beautifully done. Relevant to Massey College and to University of Toronto is the culture of academia, right? And we see the cronyism, prefer preferential treatment of certain types of people, the preferring certain types of knowledge, uh, preferring certain types 
uh, of like, folks who resemble you, right? So we have a white woman who's um, a supervisor, and when we look at who's being preferred, we see that there's a linkage to, right? And that as a black queer man, he's often isolated. So thinking a bit about what that means also for us um, in a university context, I think at Massey College, thinking of the importance of minority networks also, right? We saw that in the book when Wallace and Bridget, you know, a black man, an Asian woman, when they were together, they were able to really connect and talk and understand each other. And it shows the importance of having these communities where people can come together, have discussions, uh, be open with each other. And I think, I think the book club is, 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 is a good example of this space, right? Where you, you create a situation where people can engage in these topics meaningfully and support one another. I think it's also a broader discussion around retaining minority talent. What does that look like, right? In the book, we see that there was a donor who provided money for Wallace's scholarship, and that was it. There isn't an informal mentoring network. We don't see any racialized or professors who also had you know, a lower socioeconomic background, perhaps, who might be able to support and help Wallace. All that is absent or missing, right? And it makes us think, what are the structures that are in place in our settings, in our workplaces, in our universities, right? Do we have programs like where we try to retain certain types of talent? And if so, are they supported, right? And what do those support systems look like? So I think those are questions that we can take away um, in our own personal lives from this book. So those are most of my comments on, on the book. Uh, I really, I, th I thought it was done fantastically. Um, you know, I can see the critique that people might have about how blackness was presented, how black people were presented um, altogether. A few, and I, I think it was, it was fascinating how anti-black racism and lessons to deal with it were still portrayed in a way, even though blackness and black people weren't as prevalent in, in, in the novel. I think a lot of the people that we saw, a lot of the characters were, were white, right? Um, but it really does push us to think about what our role is in, in talking about anti-racism, dealing with it, addressing it, how it intersects with LGBTQ issues, what that might mean, um, and where you want to go moving forward as a society. That concludes my comments, but I would love to hear what folks have to say, what people thought, what your reactions to the book were. I, I would be very, very happy to, to hear that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for your, for your points. Um, we kind of been talking through dinner about some of the points uh, that, some of which you mentioned and some of which we were um, sort of talking about. I, of course, I think we, it, it's very, um, the book is so varied in the way that it gives you different outlets to relate to it. Obviously for me, it was him being in a PhD program the alienation of being racialized, being in a PhD program, for him it's being queer, for me it's being a woman. But I really like the way that you, because I was trying to figure out what it was, because there was also a lack, right? There was, it was, he was still very much surrounded by whiteness. And I really like what you, did, you said at the very end, because he is, it's a black POV, like point of view and frame, and he kind of centers his experience but it's so much, it, there's like a contrast there, right? Between his experience and then every, every sort of the environment around him and how everybody else experiences things, clearly because of all the tensions that come out in the relationships, you see this play out, right? So I was really also struck by, the New Yorker called it the, a new kind of campus narrative. And I'm wondering whether you think, is it new or is there a new sort of movement around these, so I'm thinking of like, you know, um, dear white people, and sort of a lot of more popular narratives that center blackness, queerness, but in specifically in institutions and academia. And whether this is something that you thought about mm -hmm. in relation to University of Toronto, because I know you were quite active as a graduate student here, or even maybe in, in government in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I think it is in a way revolutionary, right? Because uh, talking about blackness, queerness, and the themes I think that came up are things that are, we haven't seen before, right? Talking about sexual assault, 
centering like a black male as the subject of it, that I think is revolutionary. I think it's new. Um, seeing it manifest also in a university context, right? I think at the end of the book, that interaction with Miller, it's also a gray area, mm -hmm. right? Where you're like, is this, is this consent, consenting? Is this sexual assault, right? So I think, I think the book does a good job at pushing it further. I think what we've seen before is discussions on black queerness. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing with Brandon Taylor is discussions on black, queer, and actually potentially taboo topics that are very uncomfortable for people. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, I really appreciated the book. And the insight that yes. it gives. So I will turn it now to the audience. Uh, wondering if you have any questions. I'd also like to invite folks uh, joining us virtually. If you have any questions, you can send them to us. Hi, I guess I just wanted to say that one of the joys for me of this book club is the fact that it introduces books outside of my own frame of reference. This is not a book that I'm sure that I would have just sought out. And more and more the book club introduces us to these kinds of books where we have these kinds of conversations and pushes these kind of agendas and it's you know I just wanted to just acknowledge that and to do it in this setting and uh, just the discussion is um, really enlightening so I was challenged by the book in a number of ways and that for me was really healthy and made this book club different from other book clubs <laughs> so I so thank you for your presentation because some of what you raised um, really stands out for me. The one thing I wanted to say was that character that messed up his research that everybody has perceived as being bright and that stood out for me and I just wondered if you had uh, any um, comment around that kind of character in the academia and in the academic setting and how they get away with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point and I I think it comes back to this question of who are in positions of power, right? And um, we have an inherent bias, I think, that we have to name, which is we prefer people who remind us of ourselves. And I think it was, it was well done because Taylor didn't actually explicitly say that the supervisor prefers her because she's also a white woman. That wasn't said. So it leads us to our imagination where we're like, okay, well, why is it that she's esteemed to be so bright? This person what is it what, what what's the common tr what, what's going on here right and the more that you kind of read between the lines you see okay well this person seems to remind her of herself right and so when we I think with what's going on in our current climate in the University of Toronto actually globally with Black Lives Matter diversity inclusion um, part of our discussions have to be who's in these positions of power who's providing support and what are the, who's succeeding under their leadership, right? And are there trends, right? What's going on? What's happening? And I think it's new territory for us because Canadians, we don't like talking about uncomfortable topics. We just don't. To name discrimination, to name preferential treatment, that's outside of, I think, our general area of comfort, right? So it's exciting to see what's going to happen in the next few years with all the changes coming up, um, but also just a little bit nerve wracking. Right? Because I think a lot of racialized people have been saying and pointing this out for a long time. And at last, there's an audience that wants to listen. Right? So where do we go? How do we move forward from here? Thank you. Adding to Camille's point and what you were saying before uh, about how he should be grateful to just be there, I think it, for that instance, for me, brought up a lot of questions about being uh, racialized and women or queer or trans and the intersections of being racialized and being in academia and the, how much room there is for error depending on your position. You know, if you're just lucky to be here and I think we can all, perhaps many of us can relate to Wallace in the fact, in, in the ways that he just really throws himself into his work. Like work becomes a distraction almost from like real life, right? Mm -hmm. And you get the sense that, I mean, I think there's, 
there's another discussion around his mourning his father and so on, but the fact that he doesn't take time um, and is just sort of throwing himself into it, trying to be the perfect sort of producer of knowledge and the perfect lab um, versus, as you say, somebody who is just esteemed. We don't really know why, but we know that they, they messed up. Um, and you kind of just are sort of left wondering what would have happened if the, if the tables were flipped, if it had been the other way around. Would he still be in the program even, right? Or would he still have a supervisor? These are questions that I think when you're in grad school, you really know how serious these things are, right? Um, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say that it's a beautifully written book. The language is absolutely perfect. And it's so understandable that I could not believe it. The other thing I want to say is that it brought me back to my university UFT class of social work in 1964-65. And you could not talk about homosexuality then because it was thrown out of the university instantly and other legal matters. We have come a long way. I had to understand one of my classmates. His name was William, we called him Bill. He was black and he was gay, but no one knew it except me. And there is a reason why I knew it, but anyway. So, I had to date him and pretend we are lovers because the head of the class, there were two heads, a woman and a girl and a boy, were suspecting. And so they invited him with his girlfriend to come for the weekend at the cottage of one of them. And guess what? I did go with him and we pretended we were making love all night so that to cover him up. And this is a brand true story. And we have come so, so far away. And to top all that, my grandson, 16 years old now, went to his father when he was 12 and said, Daddy, I am gay. I know I am gay. Can you believe that? And here you have people saying that it's prostitution and it, you do it and it's not natural and all this kind of garbage nonsense. And my daughter-in-law and I knew it from the day he was three months old. So I, I, I was just fascinated reading your book. And thank you for it. I share the enthusiasm, uh, admiration, and, and the, I think the awe with which we um, with which we view this book. Uh, I immersed myself in it in the sense that I um, read it, um, had listened to the audio book, um, listened to two interviews uh, on it, and uh, also read Filthy Animals, which you may have read also, which is a collection of interconnected short stories that he has published subsequent to, um, to this book. And what I came away with is the autobiographical character of the book and, and all, his, uh, all his writings. There are, he really has drawn on his own experience for much of the events and the experience. The, the business of the rape that you referred to at the time where the mother said that after the parents had become aware of it that uh, he deserved it 
for his conduct. Uh, the father said that uh, being raped was a good life experience for him. Uh, and in the interviews, um, Taylor acknowledges that his relationship was terrible, and as he spelled it out, it was the only word is appalling is the relationship he had with his parents, especially the the mother. Um, Taylor then acknowledges that he had a mental breakdown. Um, I'm not sure if if Wallace I can't recall whether Wallace did or did not, but in any event, there's a parallel in one of the stories in in. Uh, in uh, filthy animals uh, dealing uh, with that experience. I felt in, in much of the book that I was reading it that I was absorbed into his personal headscape. Um, it, it, it really was so much of the book of, was of his uh, dealing, presenting the book through his own personal thoughts. There is very little practically nothing in the way of external events. Um, you referred to the incident where he had a problem that somebody impacted his experiments. Um, we were anxious to know who did that, but I don't think that we learned it because Taylor uh, really was so preoccupied with what was going on in, in his Wallace's head, because I bring the two of them together, that he simply dropped it, which was a, a kind of incidence of how unimportant it was uh, that um, it, what happened in the you know a tennis game, a, a swim, all of these things were were, were had no particular impressions, and I think that led to one of my problems, only problems with the book, and that is, I became somewhat fatigued by the amount of time I spent in Wallace's head. <laughs> Uh, and generally uh, found, and it wasn't just in his head, he, his mind and his thoughts were in turmoil uh, through it. And then, uh, did, I, did I mention that, that uh, of the, the breakdown, it's as if the, his head was spinning, all these endless ruminations, no conclusions particularly at any time, but we came away with a sense of a person, as I think his, his Taylor was, with, uh, with, with a very difficult time coming to terms with him, with, not just with, with the other individuals, but really with himself and identifying who he was, uh, who he is, where he is, and this then, of course, relates to the angst of his upbringing in Alabama. Thank you. Yeah, so it, it's interesting you mentioned that because to me, being in his head was actually one of my favorite parts of the book. Sorry. Being in turmoil, in, in his turmoil, and seeing what that's like consistently, mm -hmm. I think was actually one of the preferred parts of the book that, that I, I liked a lot, because it really symbolizes, I think, a day in the life of, actually, a few months in the life of a queer black person as a 20-year-old in university in grad school. It's turmoil. That's what it is. And so I, I appreciate that you mentioned, you know, it became a lot. But I think it's the reality of what that experience is like, right? And it's rare that you can actually, as someone who doesn't maybe share that identity, you get a, a, a glimpse into it, right? It was unrelenting, however. <laughs> it was, yeah. But it's, I think, realistic. Mm -hmm. It's real life. <laughs> <laughs> For a woman, I think, um, I spent a lot of time in my head thinking about some of the same things that Wallace thought about. So, as a woman, I spend a lot of time in my head, oh, sorry, thinking about um, some of the things Wallace uh, thinks about, spends a lot of time on. So, it worked for me. Which raises the question, and it's kind of ironic as I look around the room, I don't see a ton of junior fellows. Is that a fair comment? Um, and yet it's a, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, and yet it's a, I mean, one of the dimensions is, is about graduate life, right? Um, I must say, as a guy who was a graduate in French history, uh, I was fascinated by those worms. Um, <laughs> I had no idea that things could go so wrong with worms. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and that they reproduce in this absolutely fascinating manner. But, but uh, I guess what I'm, I, I, I guess it's 
it's not actually to offer a counterpoint, but it's to say the whole question of the graduate experience and the whole question about do I stay or do I go, um, I think that goes beyond being black and beyond being gay. I mean, I think that's a, a fairly universal theme if we were to ask our junior fellows, uh, you know, what are you thinking about these days? And particularly in these days when life is much less certain about the future for somebody with an academic career. So it, there is, a, I think, a deeper commonality amongst uh, Wallace and Miller and Cole and Vincent uh, who we just don't, we're not in their headspace, so we don't know that, but we can suspect that they're all trying to figure out their futures. And, and so that, that element, I think, is important to emphasize, particularly at Massey College right now. The other element, which, which kind of goes from what you were just saying, uh, Brenda, is, is that there is, uh, beyond the specificity of his hurt and his trauma, a kind of common humanity. Um, he, uh, that would be experienced by anyone who had suffered trauma, or where women in the past have suffered things that men have not. And so um, I think that actually speaks to a strength of the book because, it's, because we can empathize with him and we can wish him well in his future relationship, maybe with Miller, maybe not. But, but um, the, the specificity of his, of his <laughs> demographic, if you like, is the fact that he's black and gay in no way limits the larger humanity and the larger issues which all of us eventually confront. So I think it's a great book too. I just want to f follow up on that um, comment in that, yes, I agree that there's a common humanity that affects all graduate students. There's a common humanity of the issues or common thing about uh, um, all our experiences. But there's some uniqueness that is on top of that. So I don't know how many people here have ever been in a country where when you're on the bus, you're the only white person. And what does that feel like? Well, in all my years in healthcare, I was the only black person, the only woman of color in most boardrooms and places. So there's a constant um, sense of self that is on top of all those things. And then on top of that, as a gay woman, you know, I participated in the women's movement. And then I saw women with, who did all the work began to achieve. But then black women were left behind. I saw we did all the marching and all the fighting for gay rights. But then black gays are left behind and experience racism within the gay community. So I just, what the book did for me was to deal with the humanity, all the issues that were common, and then added these other subtle pieces to it. So all of the, them as a group had similar experiences, but there were things he experienced that the others didn't. And I thought Taylor did a good job of just bringing those other pieces out. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted to say that because there's a weight. I find that there's a weight of walking into spaces and as I look around, and the, um, the only other comment I want to make is yes, there is a nod. I must admit I came here to dinner for the Indigenous um, Week and there was a young black man in the hall and I went over to him and says, hey, I see you. I, I spoke to everybody else, but there's a different way of which when I come to Massey, I make sure I acknowledge women and people of color just to say, I see you. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you're in the majority, there's not that need to do that. Excepting we saw that in, in Africa. We saw it in the Caribbean when the English colonized, they had their own clubs where they then did that same acknowledgement. So it's not new or different. It's human, people have always done that. Do you, wanna, do you have any comments on that? 
Um, no, I mean, I saw you had your hand up too, but. There's a question from YouTube. Oh. Um, Robin Rogers said, the university in real life appears to be closely modeled on University of Wisconsin at Madison. It seems far less diverse than U of T. Is that your impression, Kevin? And also, would Wallace's experience be any different if it was set at U of T? Interesting to just imagine that. Ah, very interesting <laughs> to just imagine it. Great question. Um, you don't have to imagine it. You experience <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I did experience it. Um, Yes, I, I, th I think the experience would be different in a place like Toronto, 100%. Um, it's, Wallace was the only black queer person in his vicinity, right? You look at other classmates, had a couple of folks who were queer, but racially there was a difference. Above him, and he, I don't think in the book he encountered one other black queer person, right? And that capacity to connect I was talking about earlier, I think is so important just in terms of being able to deal with trauma, having someone who understands your experience, uh, being able to connect, being able to talk openly, makes a huge difference, right? Um, and so uh, being at U of T, I had professors who were black and queer. And to me, these are people that became mentors, people who I could go to when I was doubting myself. When I had imposter syndrome, I had someone to go to. And I think in this book, there's not one piece of that. Right? But that's one of the takeaways that, in my reflecting, I, I think people really should think about. Also, it's what mentorship looks like, what sponsorship looks like, and the importance of having representation. Right? Um, yes, those are my initial thoughts. Kevin, do you think that the, how universal is, as John said, because I think definitely the university experience is universal, then the graduate experience is a little bit more sort of niche, obviously, because you're more visible in a way and that your class sizes are smaller. You are now sort of no longer a number, but you are like a person who's been elected and you have to produce knowledge and you're an expert of whatever field you're in. But then just building on what also Camille said and this sort of not and the importance of even being seen in a place where you don't feel seen, I think, again, what the novel does really successfully is give us insight into this world, into this sort of opening where um, it's like it's such a niche experience. It is a very actually uh, unique experience, and I think the different characters sort of hit different intersections. Like at the beginning, he tells us that he and Wallace, Wallace and Miller are relate relate to each other and can see each other in a way, but what happens at the end, you realize they're coming from very different places and how they even relate to each other in the space of the academia. So I don't know, I wonder what you think about the idea of the graduate experience being universal, comparing Wisconsin to University of Toronto or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, this point around Wallace and Miller having similarities, um, being from like lower socioeconomic backgrounds, not having access to people who have been through that experience of graduate school, I think is important because when you read the book, a couple of the other classmates, their parents are professionals. Their parents have advanced degrees. They come from a family where that's an experience that's been supported, mm -hmm. right? And then you have Wallace, who's the first in his family, presumably, to go to, to get an advanced degree. And we can see just how much of a lack of a support system he has. He's also so far away from home and from his comfort zone. He's kind of been transplanted into Midwest, which is supposed to be better than maybe where he's from, but in, is also he's faced with these sort of challenges and micro and macro precisely right. Mm -hmm. um, so, could I just do one addition? I apologize for it, but you mentioned the end of the book. What I, I meant to suggest that the end of the book is, is in some ways uh, is death related because is really not certain that he wants to go on in any event. And when I speak about the identity between, between uh, Wallace uh, and uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor said he has had suicidal thoughts himself. And so this idealization and also in his personal head, the ruling around of suicidal thoughts 
led to his personal mental breakdown. So there are so many of these autobiographical. The only thing that you, you didn't touch on was the sexual element of the book. And actually, if you do get a chance to read Filthy Animals, it, it, it's a continuation of the thoughts that there are in the book. But boy, it would sing out. And one of them that he explores in those in, in the stories is male violence and the source of male violence, which is a certain kind of death wish that he explores. So these additional themes of the sexual relationship between groups and obviously within the gay relationships are continuing themes that he carries forward into into the set of four stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, for me, at least when we think about sex and sexuality, it was, I think Taylor was quite graphic with a lot of the descriptions in the book with the sex that was happening. Uh, it was very, very clear to us. Um, and even then, when we think about the roles that Taylor was, or Wallace was taking in the book, generally speaking, I think he was pushing boundaries by, you know, as a black person even, being mostly the submissive or the, recept the receptive partner. Right? And we look at perceptions of blackness, black masculinity, like I was talking about, actually usually you're expected to be the dominant or insertive partner. Right? So already, I think Taylor is pushing, pushing us to think about our ideas of black queerness, black sexuality, and kind of tossing us on our heads, right? which I think was well done. Um, you had your hand up for quite some time. see the alienation and um, difficulties in being in a grad school with uh, f frictions among colleagues and uh, a, a, f a lab partner who messes up your, so I, all that I can see. But then I look at his family background and I'm curious, I, I have my own view of what direction he'd go at what he'd do. I wonder what you think he'll do. <laughs> with his family? I know, with, uh, in grad school, and what, what he's going to and do. And where he's going to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think he's going to stay. I think he's going to stay, <laughs> and, I think, and I think he's, he's going to finish, right? Because we, we see throughout the book remnants of his resilience, right? We see that. You know, he's someone who's already been through sexual assault, and you could see that slowly throughout the book, he's working through and having these first experiences, finally, where he's challenging himself and naming things. So I think based on how he's been interacting so far in the book, um, I think he's going to stay. Whether, uh, and whether he'll have difficulties with the administration, right? And uh, he wasn't asked to leave, but he was asked to reconsider. And... Um, I think because he doesn't have a support system that's as effective and strong, I'm not sure you know, how far he'll go, but I do think, at least for the foreseeable future, he'll, he'll go back. Those and are my will thoughts. he stay with Miller? <laughs> will he stay with Miller? I do not think that relationship is going to persist. I think they're, they're likely gonna split up. Uh, we saw, I think what I would say, like passion in that relationship. Uh, it was his first experience. Uh, really kind of consensual experience with another man uh, as an adult. Uh, but we also saw the fundamental differences of not feeling understood, right? And I think that's something that you generally need with the partners, to feel like that person really gets you. And he said, you know, I'm getting sick of Miller just saying sorry, just apologizing when something happens to me, right? So I think that relationship likely will not last. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there a reason why you think that he would stay in the program? Is it because, because I was, I was thinking about this too and I thought it's obviously, and also what he was going to stay with Miller, but I was thinking in both cases it's really important that he leaves that to our imagination, right? Mm -hmm. That we have to kind of wonder what happens beyond the book and sort of 
judging on how important, for example, these are to him, these two different, very kind of big, big parts of his life. But I was wondering whether you thought he would go back because you felt like the weight of him being in grad school, how it meant so much to him that he was going to fight for it. But in, and, and again, in both cases, I thought it's like, whether he goes back to Miller or whether he goes back to graduate school or not, it's at what cost mm -hmm. to him, his mental health, his well-being. And so it's kind of when you're imagining beyond the, the novel, you're thinking, okay, if again, he's, like, he's kind of doomed in both ways, right? Whether he stays or goes. Mm -hmm. He is, but... Not to be, <laughs> not to put a, you know, a damper on it. But. Yeah, I think for me, I see, we see the growth in this character as you read the book. He's not the same person from the first 15 pages. At the end, you see very much someone who uh, seems daring in some cases, mm -hmm. who seems um, a bit more confident, right? So I think with that and with his experiences and with his growth, I, I, I see it as an upward trajectory. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think he's going to want to go back to Alabama. I don't think he's going to want, actually, he has much to go back to with both his parents having passed away. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's going to stick around. But hopefully there's like a part two that comes out. <laughs> so. <laughs> what about the title? Any comment? Is the title of the book ironic? Or is it really a, a, a world that really encompasses the totality of the book and its theme? Because academia, you know, is said not to be the real world. So there's yeah. a irony there, but what is the real world? And I think it's a it's an overarching metaphorical uh, question really about the purpose of life and the purpose of existence because you search for the real world, but the real world is something that cannot be found. Yes, <laughs> I agree with you entirely. Uh, and actually wrote my notes, uh, the first clear reference of the title came up on page 239. And it was uh, the situation where <laughs> Vincent and Cole were, they had their argument about the open relationship information that leaked or was brought up. And then uh, Vincent confronts Wallace and says, you know, this is real life. You can't just play with people's emotions, right? And the reaction that Wallace has is he says, you're right. Instead of saying, actually, I did this for your boyfriend who told me about everything, he just said, you know what, you're right. right. And so dealing with these situations that happen in our lives, dealing with the tumultuous, the unknown, and seeing how people react, and how, in this case, Wallace reacted and said, I'm just not going to deal with the conflict. I'm not going to be the one that disturbs the peace. Right? I think also leaves us with, with, with that to sit with. right? How do you respond to these situations when they come up, to life when it's difficult and tumultuous? What's the response? Do you just assimilate and mind your business, or do you, do you fight back, right? So I did, I think, uh, yeah, the title was definitely an ironic. Great, a great take. I, I, I appreciated it. What are, did anyone else have thoughts on the title? Yes. Uh, sorry, it's an, uh, um, on a different point, but I want to make sure you respond historically. The gay, in the gay community, there have been way more open conversation and dialogue and language around sex and sexuality than there has been in the straight community. But the behaviors are often the same, but not discussed in the same open manner. And I just wondered if, if, if you would comment on that. I mean, in the straight community, except for a, a subpopulation that would have a, you know, key parties and stuff like that. There has been, you know, people have affairs and stuff, but you don't often have couples having that kind of conversation. But that has been very common in the gay community forever. And there's actual language in which to have those conversations. So I just wondered, and Taylor put it out there, I thought. I just wanted your comments no, on that. I, I, I see it too, and it's. I think we, when we do see a discussion on sex and sexuality in a hetero context in the book, uh, the reaction that you see and the depth of it is very shallow, right? So at the beginning of the book, when Wallace gets kissed on the lip by, um, by his friend, 
And her boyfriend, Tom, is like, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you kissing him on the lips? Yeah. And you see this interesting discussion around, well, he's gay, so me kissing him really means nothing. He's, and you see kind of the male, straight, strong reaction and the discomfort in talking about sex and the fluidity and the gray, right? So I, I agree with you. I think historically, queerness and queer folk have been able to talk about sex more openly. And even in this book, we see when it comes to a straight context, it's very limited and it's actually discomforting. And usually it's harder for men to talk about, about sex, right? Even just their relationship. So, uh, but you also have a lot of characters that are unclear what their sexual orientations are or their connection to sex. Like, was it one guy, un I don't know how to pronounce that name, but Y-N-G-V-E. Um, he had a crush on Lucas. It wasn't very clear, but he had this girl he was kind of talking to and seeing. And I think what the book does is situates queerness and sexuality on a scale, which I think isn't often done. Usually you have, you see folks and you see that they're gay or they're straight. But here in this book, you have characters that are queer, transitioning, questioning in this spectrum, which I think is a better representation of how sexuality looks like today. And I think that scene between, with the three of them, that triangle, is particularly important because he kind of becomes, in this way that they kind of like flatten, well, he's gay, right? But then the triangle doesn't make any sense. And he's just sort of standing back as, the, as this something that happened to him, as something that happened to him. And he just, again, like just holds the silence. He doesn't, he doesn't want to kind of ruffle any feathers. And I think he just, I think he just sighs. Right, his response is just after he's been kissed by this woman unconsensually, and then her boyfriend comes running down saying, what are you doing? And then she just kind of flippantly says, oh, you know, it wasn't a big deal, he's gay, right? And he's just, just completely, um, just becomes kind of like a, a bystander almost in this, in this event that was, um, at that point in the novel, pretty like big, right? Mm -hmm. It's a pretty a big development. Um, I wonder if there are any last Final comments? We're coming next to time. Hi there. Um, I, I will ca put, start with a caveat, which is that I actually came here to decide whether or not I wanted to read the book. <laughs> so I will be very honest about that. But. Um, Two, just two little thoughts. One is that I really encourage the white folks in the room, as a scholar of whiteness myself, and as someone who's lived in white-dominated institutions for many decades, to try and think about how what we perceive as individual or psychological issues are shaped by the structural forces that white people create. And by that I mean that I have seen, being an academic for a number of decades now, the way in which mental unhealth is created by white dominated institutions. And the other thing that I just want to sort of put on the agenda is I really want to applaud you for linking those issues around fluid sexuality and queerness with the question of assimilation. Because particularly in a country that applauds itself on its achievement of gay marriage, we need to remember that before that moment came historically, there were a whole range of gender and sexual possibilities that have now largely been foreclosed. And so some of those more diverse things that it sounds like are going on in the book I mean, I'm thinking about, for example, the Law Commission, the Law Reform Commission of okay. Canada, which produced this incredible document, which I encourage all of you who are interested in questions around gender and sexuality, go and dig up, which is called Beyond Conjugality. And there was this incredible moment in Canada before gay marriage became our you know, heaven-sent solution to everything where we as a society might entertain something broader than just K 
gay people assimilating into looking like straight white people. And we gave that opportunity up. So as someone who came here to figure out whether I wanted to read the book, and thank you very much because you made me want to read the book, um, I just offer those little thoughts. So thank you all for, for being here, for um, opening yourselves up to the conversation. I want to thank Kevin again for coming all the way from Ottawa to present this book for us. And thank you for joining um, uh, virtually. We hope to see you at our uh, next um, event coming up. Please check for the um, book club events on the calendar if you haven't been doing so. I know some folks are having a hard time um, finding where that's happening. Um, thank you again. Have a great night, everyone. Take good care. <laughs>